Yeah, yeah, give the Lord a hand clap. Come on. Woo! Jesus! Listen, if you're at home today or wherever you're at, if you're at work, if you're in the bed watching this and you got your bowl of Cheerios or whatever it is, I just want you just to set it down just for a minute, just to lift up your hands and let's just magnify God. God, we just thank you. We love you. We adore you. You are a way maker where there seems to be no way. You're the one who makes a way. You are a miracle worker. You are a promise keeper. And today, God, we've gathered in this place because we know what your word says. Where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be. And we believe that you're here today. Day. The same way that you're here, you're in homes all around our community today, and we're going to lift you up and know that you've heard our voice, because your word says that your ear is attuned to our cry. So God, we thank you, we love you, we adore you, and so Father, may you receive our worship today, and Lord, may you open up the windows of heaven and pour out upon us, Father, because God, it is our desire to connect with you Lord, may our hearts be in tune with your heart. And God, may you speak to us today. For it's in your name we pray. Everybody in the house, everybody in the Lord's house, somebody give him praise. Just one more time. Come on, one more time. Yeah. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Woo. Can I have you just to remain on your feet for just another minute or so? Just, I know that some of y'all are at home saying, oh, there's people there. Yeah. We had some true blue people who just wanted to come out and praise the Lord this morning. I'm just talking about it's a packed house. I don't know what I, I don't know what Ian's talking about. We've got a skeleton crew here. I just know it's a packed house. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit's here. Woo! Let me tell you something. This morning, I, I, I'm not one of those that can preach to an empty house, Daniel. I'm just not one of those dudes. I just, I, I just, you know, not only does the Holy Spirit energize me. But seeing what the Holy Spirit is doing through the word energizes me. And so I'm glad that some of you guys are here today just to cheer on the word of the Lord. Somebody say, yeah, I'm here. So I want you to hang with me today. I've got a word that's in my belly. It's been trapped up for two weeks. It's been trapped up for two weeks. I, listen, I wanted to make sure that we kept everyone safe. We got a lot of people who call up and send a church home. And they're scattered out all over this county and outside of this county. Some people drive a long way to come to this church and last night it was just I, I texted our leadership team and I said somebody else is gonna have to make this decision because I've just got one gear and that gear is go <laughs> and I did not want to put anybody in danger and so listen we just made the choice to what we felt like would be the, the safest for you at home but I hope that you're tuned in I, I want you to just right now share this message with someone because really that's what this message is going to be about okay how many of you are ready for what the Lord has for you today? You ready? You ready? Because I believe the Lord is going to give us one of those talking tubes. I mean, I think he's going to talk to our spirit. He's going to communicate with our spirit today. And out of that communication, we're going to learn something. We're going to have a change of, of, of mindset. We're, we're, we're going to go in a new direction. It's going to be like my grandma. She used to say to me, she'd say, boy, I'm going to give you a good talking to. I don't know if any of you ever had that experience. Boy, I'm going to give you a good talking to. And I would come out of that conversation with new ideas, with a fresh perspective, with, with, with a new direction. You see, that's what God's word will do. Why? Because his word says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His word says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not upon your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I'm going to preach up in here, but I'm going to need y'all to help me. I'm going to need somebody to say preach. preach. So here we are in this series, Build. Everybody say build. build. It's the theme for Epicenter Church for 2022. It's based upon this, this concept that comes out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, where Paul writes that God is building us together for the purpose of growing the kingdom, that soul upon soul upon soul is working together in order to construct the kingdom, if you will. You see, we're all builders. Somebody say, I'm a builder. I'm a builder. Tap your neighbor and say, you're a builder. In, in the chat, listen, I don't, I'm not forgetting you today because you're, you're important. In the chat, say, I'm a builder. But understand something. The, the, the definition of build, Mike, is, is to construct something using parts and materials. To put parts and materials together in order to construct something. 
The definition of builder is the person who puts parts and materials together in order to construct something. We all are called to help construct the kingdom of God. And today, God is going to give us one more tool in the toolbox that will help us be the builders that he's called us to be. Are you ready for that? Yes. Let me tell you something. Here, here's the deal. Today, we're going to talk about the building process is, is very much tied to the way you communicate, the language that you use. Some of y'all right now are saying, oh, Lord, he must have heard me cuss that guy out. I'm going deeper than that. I'm going deeper. I'm going deeper. I'm I'm talking about the language that you use with God and about God. Because the language that we use with God and about God tells others around us who God is to us. Mm. Can I give you the title before I give you the text? So the language that we use with God and about God paints a picture. And the picture that our story should paint should always point to his story. Did you grab that? The the story that our lives tell should always point to his story. That doesn't mean we're going to always do everything right because God will use the mess that we've been in in order to be a part of the message so that other people learn the message of Jesus Christ through the mess that we lived in. Oh, good Lord have mercy. So here's the title. Here's the title. You ready? You ready? Let's talk about it. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, let's talk about it. In the chat at home, say, let's talk about it. Woo! So here's the title. Here's the title. There's the title. Here's the text. It's Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Somebody say, I'm going there. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Can y'all stand on your feet for just another minute? I'm glad you can because we're going to do some reading together. Here we go. Acts chapter 4. Verses 1 through 22, I'm going to read just part of the narrative, maybe some of the narrative, maybe all of the narrative, and then we're going to pause, do some work. We're going to sit down, and we're going to have some fun. Everybody, let's go. It says this. The priest and captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So grab the image. Here's Peter and John. They're actually standing before the Sanhedrin or are about to be standing before the Sanhedrin. It says this. They were greatly disturbed, they being all of these people who were against Peter and John. They were greatly disturbed because these apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. In other words, they were talking about, whoo, Jesus has resurrected. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? They, was, they were talk, talking about that, and, and so everybody was kind of getting upset. So they seized Peter and John, and, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. Verse 4, but many who heard the message believed. Ooh, somebody say believed. believed. They're talking about a belief system now. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Hold on a second. But many who heard the message believed but many who heard the message believed daniel you know what that tells me that tells me that good news travels faster than bad news you know we're in our culture we're always just kind of inundated with the bad news of the media but good news travels fast in fact all of the people were beginning to hear about what jesus was doing and as the word was traveling people were being saved it said so grab this i'm going to challenge you at home listen In 2022, why don't we use our social media platforms to build hope rather than repost some trash? Mm, No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Let's go on and continue to read. So it says the next day, because something shifts, the plot shifts, the shift happens. It says the next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, and John Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh uh-oh, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all of the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, and this man stands before you today and he is healed. Can you imagine this? Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. Uh Uh-oh. The stone you builders rejected. In other words, we're all building something. 
which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else other than him, in no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Hold on a second, because this is good. Right now, he's standing before all of these people, and he's saying to them, there is a name, (laughs) and that name is a great name. And what you guys are saying, and you're telling us to stop talking about it, and you thought you were building something, but really all you were doing was tearing something down. But while you've been tearing something down, God's been building something and he's been building that something on the cornerstone and that cornerstone has a name and his name is Jesus he's Yeshua he's the first the last the beginning the end he is the Lamb of God somebody help me up in this place today so he's been building on that name and that name is Jesus and then verse 13 and following hold on a second I need somebody to hear this because right now I feel like in my spirit that Somebody feels like the odds are stacked against you in life. Can I tell you something? At this moment in time, historians will tell you that there were at least 11 people or people groups against the early Christ followers. That should give you hope to know that when the odds are stacked against you, that God is for you. So let's go on to read. It says, and when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Man, that a preach. They took note. People take note that you've been with Jesus. People take note. Somebody say, let's talk about it. Their lives were expressing something. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What, what are we going to do with these men? They ask. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they performed a notable sign, a miracle. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further... Among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them to speak, not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help to speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. As for us, we cannot help but to speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. They're reiterating our title. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Let's talk about it. Somebody just look at your neighbor and say, let's talk about it. And then you can sit down. At home, grab that bowl of Cheerios, but keep your pen and notepad handy because I believe God's got something for you. So keep in mind, let me give you some context here. Here's Peter and John. Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin. We can't help but to talk about it. What is it that they can't help but to talk about? Corey, they can't help but to talk about their relationship with Jesus because their relationship with Jesus has changed the very core, the very fabric of who they are. Their relationship with Jesus has brought them out of something and into something else, has brought them out of something old and into something new, has brought them out of a place of brokenness and into a place of wholeness. And you can't help but to talk about Jesus when he's done that for you. Once you experience the grace of God, you can't help but to talk about it. But understand something. The Sanhedrin was more focused on trying to stop what they were talking about. Let me set up what they were talking about. It was a miracle that happened in John chapter, or in Acts chapter 3. We Last week, if you tuned in online, we were in Acts chapter 3 looking at the miracle. Today, we're in Acts chapter 4 talking about why the miracle happened. But in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were on the way to the temple to pray at the time of prayer, about 3 in the afternoon, going to pray. Outside of the temple, the temple gates were scattered all of these people who would stay outside of the temple gates in order to beg because it was their only means for sustenance. It was the only way they could survive. But think about this with me for a moment. They're outside of the temple gates. Why would they be outside of the temple gates? They're outside of the temple gates because the house of God is supposed to be benevolent. So they're outside of the temple gates begging, help! 
money. I'm poor. I need some bread. I, I need something to eat. And so every day they were hoping that someone going into the temple would, would, would give them something. Someone coming out of the temple would be moved by God and would give them something. And this day Peter and John walked up and the Bible says that Peter locked eyes with the dude. And he said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I freely give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the dude got up and walked. Why? Because he walked on a name. He walked on the name Jesus Christ. He walked on the name Yeshua. He walked on the name Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He walked on a name that brought the power to his life that he ultimately needed. It wasn't silver or gold. It wasn't a piece of bread. It was the bread of life. It was Jesus Christ himself that he needed. And now here is Peter and John standing before the Sanhedrin and they're saying, don't talk about that name again and Peter's saying I can't help but to talk about what I've seen and heard why because the overflow of his heart is who Jesus is think about this with me and the Bible says that out of the overflow of your heart the mouth speaks so what Peter was saying is God's done so much for me I can't help but to talk about what he's done for me out of the overflow somebody say overflow it, it, it reminds me of Psalms chapter 23 where David writes the Psalms for the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, well, on down in it, he says, and, and the, he causes my cup to overflow and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. He causes my cup to overflow. In other words, even though I'm going through difficulty, I can't help but to talk about how good Jesus is. So it's flowing out of me. It's overflowing out of my heart. So let me ask you this question because I think this is where you know, you can't just hear a message. You've got to take a message and see how it applies to you. You've got to do an internal inspection. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So let me ask you this question. What's overflowing out of your life? Because your life is telling a story. What is it that is overflowing? Because the Bible says out of your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. So what is the overflow of your life saying? Because we're all saying something. We're all building something. And Mike, the overflow in Scripture is just the overflow of your heart, the term heart in Scripture, is really just another way to say belief system. Your belief system will cause you to communicate something. What you believe in, you will communicate that. Can I talk about your belief system for a minute? Is that all right? I need some help here. Feels lonely up in this place. <laughs> Woo! Your belief system, it's, it's one thing to say you believe in something. It's another thing to live as if you believe in that something. But in our culture, typically speaking, our belief system comes from an experience that we've had. In other words, we experience something, and out of that experience, we gain a belief. And out of that belief comes the truth in which we live by. But that's not necessarily biblical. Let me give you an example. You may have a bad experience at Taco Bell. Pastor Ian loves Taco Bell, man. He could eat Taco Bell every single day. I mean, he could eat it for breakfast. He could eat it for lunch. He could eat it for dinner. He just loves it. But... Let's just say that Ian had a bad experience at Taco Bell and he had a hair in his burrito. All of a sudden, Ian, just his mind changes about Taco Bell and he no longer likes Taco Bell because he had a bad experience. He had hair in his burrito. And that experience now causes him to say, Taco Bell's, plural, stink. Not going back there. That experience becomes a belief that ultimately becomes the truth in which he lives by. We do that in our culture. So many times the truth in which we live by has no truth to it at all. Give you another example. You can have one bad experience in a church and then say all churches stink. You can buy a Chevrolet and that Chevrolet, that one Chevrolet may be a lemon and you have more problems with it. You have more difficulties with it. You have more scenarios and situations with it. You dump more money into it. And therefore, that is your experience. And as a result of that experience, your belief system is all Chevrolets are lemons. And therefore, you're no longer eating at Taco Bell. You're no longer going to church and you're driving Fords. 
<laughs> you see what I'm saying? We do that in our faith as well, Mike. We do that in our faith. You know why? Because we'll let an event and experience become our belief system, which becomes the truth in which we live by. We'll have a failure in our lives. We'll begin to believe that we are a failure. And then the truth is we start telling people that we're a failure. We'll have a place of pain in our lives or a broken moment in our lives. It becomes the belief system that that's who we are. And therefore, we live by the truth that that's who we'll always be. And as a result of that experience that becomes part of our belief, that now is the truth that we live by, our opportunity or ability to build is greatly hampered. All because of a piece of pain or a piece of difficulty, rather than it being a building material, we allowed it to be a termite. And the termite began to tear down the structure in which God was building. Mm. Hold on a second, because that's what I see when I see this story with Peter. Because this story with Peter almost didn't happen. If, if you think about it, this story with, with Peter, it, 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 it almost didn't happen because there was a place of pain in his life that turned into a place of bitterness, that, that turned into a place to where, listen, let me just explain it. Several, several weeks before he's standing before the Sanhedrin, and he's saying, I can't help but to talk about what I've seen and heard. Several weeks before that, that's not where Peter was at. Several weeks before that, Peter's hanging out with the other disciples and with Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to die a horrible death. I'm going to be crucified. But I'm going to rise again. He's going through the things that are going to happen. And all the disciples are, like, bewildered. They're like, no, this can't happen. And Peter's like, ah, no, ain't no way. No way, Jesus Christ, are we allowing that? Peter, in his gross voice, and his masculine voice, he's like, uh-uh. He's the alpha male amongst, amongst the group. And he's like, no, we're not going to allow that. I'm with you, Jesus. I, I'm, it's ride or die, Jesus. You're my homie. I'm never going to allow that to happen. And Jesus cut him off and said, Peter, you'll deny that you even knew me three times before the rooster ever crowed. Won't ever happen, Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, guess what? They came and arrested Jesus in the process of the crucifixion. Somebody came up to Peter and said, hold on a second, dude. Aren't you the guy that's with him? Peter's like, who are you talking about? I ain't never seen that guy before. I don't know who he is. Well, you kind of sound like a Galilean. You kind of talk like he does. <coughs> I got a cold, man. I got, uh, I got a cold. I don't, I, don't sound, I don't know him. Three times he did this, and then guess what happened? The rooster crowed. Hold on, you got to grab this. The moment the rooster crowed, Peter remembered what Jesus told him. But most of all, Peter remembers what he told Jesus. I'd never do that to you. Now he feels like a failure. And because he feels like a failure, because he feels like he failed, because he hurt himself, because he hurt Jesus Christ, because he hurt the disciples, he couldn't live with the pain. He couldn't live with every, could you imagine, listen, we have, we have our phones and alarm clocks that wake us up today. But in that day and age, you know what woke you up every morning? A rooster. Every morning, as soon as he woke up, he was reminded that he's a failure. So guess what? It became his belief system. It was the truth in which he lived by. And, and the Bible says that he went back to an old way of life. I, I need you to hear this. Pain has the ability to tear down what God is building in you if you allow it to become a termite that begins to eat away at that structure. Or you can use pain as a part of the building material. You can use pain as a part of the building material, the process in which God uses to build you up, or you can allow it to be something that tears you down. And I know that this sounds so Christian cliche. I know this does, that pain has a purpose. Oh, pain has a purpose. I've heard preachers say it. Oh, pain has a purpose. And, and, and when you hear it and you're going through pain, you want, you want to just punch that dude in the ma mouth. Because you're like, well, I, I don't feel no, any purpose for this pain. I, I'm tired of this pain. I'm tired of this sickness. I'm sick of this problem. But I need you to hear me for a moment because pain has such a purpose in your life. And you can look at it as a part of the building material that God is using to construct something in you. Because pain so often will draw you closer to Jesus if you will allow it to. It will draw you closer to him. And the pain that's in your life will cause you to have a struggle, Daniel. And the struggle that you're having will only cause you to have strength. 
It's the result of the struggle that you're being strengthened. Think about it. If you're working out, you have to first tear your muscles down, break them down before they can be built up. You see, that's what pain does. It begins to break you down, but God is building you up and he's giving you strength through the struggle. So the fact that you're having a struggle or the fact that you've got a place of pain in your life should only this morning cause you to rise up on the inside and know that God is for you, that he's with you, and that the enemy is trying to keep you from what God has for you. Pain, it's like you can go to Lowe's and you can say, okay, on this shelf I got some lumber. On this shelf I got some pain. Let me get that out because God's going to use it as part of the building material. You need to see it that way. I know it's difficult. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make light of your pain. I'm just trying to tell you that you can look at it differently. So Peter, back to Peter. Peter, Peter's like, I'm going back to an old way of life. I'm, I feel like I've hurt so many people. I feel like I've got so much failure in my life. It became a part of his belief system. In fact, let me show you something. I, didn't, I don't know that I even gave you guys this, but John, let me, let me flip back over to John chapter, John chapter 21. Somebody say John chapter 21. John chapter 21. So, 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 so Peter says, Peter says, I'm just going. So Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected. But Peter goes back to, to fishing. He says, guys, I'm just, I'm just going fishing. You know, I had this thought. You know why he's going fishing? And the Bible says that he fishes all night. Do you know why? I, 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 this hit me. The Spirit put this in me. Do you know why? Because he's out on the ocean. What's not on the ocean? A rooster. He's far enough away from the shore that he doesn't have to listen to that. He can, I, I'm going to a place that I don't feel like I'm reminded of this. Ooh, Lord have mercy. I could take that in a million different directions. But look what happens right here. It says in verse 15, before I read verse 15, in some of your translations, it says the title of this section of scripture says Jesus restores Peter. It says when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Let me set this up. So Peter was out on the water. He was fishing, and Jesus walks up on the shore, and he said, Have you guys caught any fish? Have you guys caught any fish? No, we've been out here fishing all night. We had not caught a thing. Well, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. At that moment, after all of this happens, and this big net comes in, Peter realizes that it's the Messiah on the shore. And the Bible says that he takes off his, his outer garment and he dives into the water and he swims to shore. Think about this with me for a moment. He's not walking on water. He's having to swim this time. Probably barely staying afloat. Before he walked on some water because his belief system was full of, 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 of faith. But now his belief system is full of failure. He swims to the shore, he swims to the shore. And the Bible says that Jesus restores Peter. But, but, but look at this restoration process. It says, when they came to the shore, they finished eating. Simon, son of John, do you have, do you love me more than these? He's talking about fish, by the way. Do you love me more than these? He's going back to an old, do you love me more than that? Woo! Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That's the second time Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Mm -hmm. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times he said he, 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 he denied Christ. Three times now he has to say that he loves Christ. Yes, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Hold on a second. He's, he's, he's saying, Peter, all of that pain, I'm, I'm going to use it as a building block. But I need you to pivot. I need you to pivot. I need you to turn. I need you to, I need you to focus on building my sheep and loving my sheep and feeding my sheep rather than feeding these fish. Rather than catching these fish. I need you to, this is what I need you to, to do. And so Peter at that moment was restored. And later Peter could write, and the God of all grace, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you. Grab this. Oh, this is so good. So Peter is now, he's had this shift. And, and you can use the pain as a building material or it can be a termite. But it depends on what you're talking about. Because if you continue to talk about your brokenness, you're going to always feel broken. 
if you continue to talk about your failure, you're going to always feel like a failure. But Peter didn't allow the process of his pain to keep him from who God wanted him to be because when Jesus began to speak back into his spirit, he realized, hold on a second, I've got a purpose. And my pain had a purpose and I have a purpose. You see, you can allow your belief system to be brought down to the level of your pain or you can allow your belief system to give you a new perspective in your pain. We can learn something from Peter here, y'all, because you can allow the topic of your conversation to be your trial or you can allow your topic of conversation to be his truth. Did you hear me? You see, Peter could have allowed the topic of conversation to be about the rooster for the rest of his life, but instead he chose to allow the topic of his conversation to be about the restoration that Jesus brought to him. I cannot help but to talk about what I have seen and I have heard. You see, you can allow the the difficulty in your life to be your conversation piece, or you can allow the destiny that God has for you to be your conversation piece. But you've got to stop allowing the enemy to dictate what you are talking about about and can I be honest with you we, we've turned the year and everybody wants to live their best life Woo, living my best life and we're all out looking for a book that will help us fi- find the best life right here's your book your story is in his story and your story should always point to his story because his story is about what he wants to do in and through you but can I tell you something Let me get up in your business for a minute. You can't navigate life. You can't be the builder that God wants you to be without having, without clearly interpreting his word for your life. Scripture tells us, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said that don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. In other words, if I give you a word or someone else gives you a word, live that word, apply that word, practice that word. We've got to get in the word. Everybody's got a smartphone. You ought to take your smartphone out at home right now and download a Bible app. An app that sends you a scripture verse every single day. And when you get that scripture verse, spend a few minutes reading that scripture verse, saying a prayer and praying that scripture verse and say, God, cause this to become real and evident in my life today. Get into God's word. Can I tell you something? You can't just come to church and treat the symptom. Church attendance is good, but you can't just come to church and treat the symptom. You've got to get into God's word because God's word won't just treat the symptom. God's word will deal with the problem so that the symptom goes away. Good God Almighty. Somebody going to help me up in this place. Woo. So we got we to gotta, we gotta get into God's word and we got to understand what God... It's God's word is it's the building material that God will use. And listen, the enemy was basically trying to squelch Peter's conversation. Basically, they said, you've got to stop talking about this. And Peter said, I can't stop talking about it. The enemy was trying to squelch his testimony. The enemy will try to squelch your testimony. He'll try to tell you nobody wants to hear your testimony. He'll try to tell you your testimony was, is a bad testimony. He'll try to tell you that's who you've always going to be. But listen, when you begin to tell your testimony in the place that you've come from, you know what happens? That's when it becomes the victory, not just in your life, but the victory for someone else's life. Lord have mercy. But can I tell you something? I, can I take a few more minutes? Is that all right? It's impossible. You've got to get into God's word and get a word. Let me just say that. You've got to get a word for your life and you've got to stand on that word. You've got to hold on to that word. But it is impossible to, to get a word from God to hold on to unless you're holding on to God's word. Daniel, come up here. I'm going to use you as an illustration, man. I wasn't going to do this, Daniel, but I'm, I'm going to do this. I want you to stand right there, Daniel. Just stand right there. No, right, right there. No, I like you back over there. That's pretty good. You got to hold on to God's word, Daniel. You can't get a word from God to hold on to without holding on to his word. Without holding on to his word. Let me, let me illustrate something for you. I want you to hold this. I want you to hold this like a football. Hold it like that and put it up, put it up your shoulder like that, okay? Lefty. You're a lefty. All right. All right, just hold it right there. I want you to hold it with both hands. 
my youngest son and our youngest son, Jacob, um, was a, a very talented um, athlete in high school. Won all kinds of awards uh, in multiple sports. Football was probably his best sport. Um, was recruited to play in, in college. Um, won in two different positions. He won all conference and all region. His best position was quarterback. And so we set him up with a quarterback trainer and he had uh, gone to all of these different camps and had won all of these awards and ended up being all region quarterback, which was a, um, a, a big deal because he ended up being ranked in the top quarterback, one of the top quarterbacks in North and South Carolina. He was in the top eight. In this process, we took him to a quarterback trainer that began to instill in him, you can't look for the completed pass without first taking care of the ball. And so he would do this drill to where he would have Jacob run in place. I'm not going to have you run in place, but he would have him run in place with the ball over his, over his shoulder as if he's ready to throw the ball. And he would sit here right beside of him and he'd slap that ball while he's doing that. You know why? He's trying to distract him from the completion. He's trying to get his eyes off the target. He's trying to get him to stop looking at where he's throwing the ball. But more than that, he's also trying to steal the ball from him. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because when the quarterback drops back and he's getting ready to throw the ball, he takes his hands off the ball. All of a sudden, you watch defenders. They'll swing for the ball. You know why? Because they want to knock the ball out. That way they can stop the completion. That's the way the enemy works. You're holding on to the word. He tries to slap the word away from you. And it's not just the difficulties in life that cause him to slap the word out of your hand or out of your heart. It's not. It's all kinds of things. It can be busyness. Woo! Because if the enemy can't make you really, really bad, he'll make you really, really busy. Because your eyes will no longer be looking at the target. You'll be looking away. You know what else he can do? He'll try to slap that word out of your hand because he'll, you, you'll make social media a greater priority and the image that you display on social media a greater priority than reflecting his image. Somebody say, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all will pull your phone out and you'll take 25 different pictures from 25 different angles. Oh, my chin looks fat. Let me get my neck up. So that you can post the right image. And don't say I'm lying because you know I'm lying. you got to have the right image. And that image becomes so important to you. And you'll take 20 pictures to get the right image on social media. It's got to be right. But you won't take 20 minutes to get your spirit right. And so he's slapping at that word, man. Trying to get that word out of you. But I want to prophesy something over you this year, Epicenter Church. God wants to build something in you. I want to prophesy over you what God has freely given to me. And I want to give you the name of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ of Nazareth is saying to you to get up and walk because I'm about to do something great in your life. I'm about to build something great in your life. I'm about to do something that you never even dreamed or imagined. And are you ready? Somebody say, let's talk about it. Give me back this Bible, Daniel. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. A couple more minutes and I'm going to be done. I need you to grab this. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's talk about it. So Peter. Peter could have talked about the brokenness. Peter could have talked about the problem. Peter could have talked, but Peter didn't. When he's standing before, I can't help but to talk about what I've seen and heard. Guys, I know you're telling me to stop, but I can't help but to talk about what I've seen and heard. And what I've seen and heard is the graciousness of Jesus Christ being poured over my life. I can't help but to talk about that. You see, you can talk about brokenness, but you'll never be talking about breakthrough if you do. You can talk about your difficulty, but you'll always miss the destiny that God has for you. You've got to talk about the things that God wants you to talk about. You've got to talk about God. God in the way that God needs to be talked about because when you begin to do that it's out of the it's out of the overflow of your heart the mouth speaks I'm gonna do an illustration that I, I really probably shouldn't do but I, I'm gonna do I, 
Camera, I want you to just get in as close as you can right here on that cup. Can you get in there? Can you get in there? Are you there? How close are you? All right, that's cool. Right there, right there, right there. Let me, let me say this to you. God will place you in places. He'll place you in your workplace. He'll place you in school. He'll place you in your neighborhood. He'll place you in relationships. He's going to place you in certain places. And then God will fill you up in those places. He'll fill you up. But can I ask you something? What good is being filled up if you're not pouring out? Because if you're filled up, you can't take anything else in. So if you're filled up, you've only received just so much of what God is willing to pour into your life. But God wants out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth to speak. It's like Psalms 23, for the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside of quiet waters. He restores my soul. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for his rod and his staff. They comfort me and surely... Hold on a second, but hold on, there's a cup that he fills up. He anoints my head with oil and he causes my cup to overflow. But Mike, can I tell you something? The overflow of the cup does you no good. Why? Because you can't contain it. But God will put you in a place to where you cannot contain it if you will allow him to pour it out of you. And then all of a sudden, it's coming all around you. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to be any good for you, but it's going to be a lot of good for a lot of those people around you. And the enemy is going to say to you, "Uh uh-oh, the enemy is going to say, you can't do that. The naysayers are going to say, you better stop that. But God's going to say, I'm going to keep pouring in you as long as you keep talking about me. And when you talk about the goodness of who I am, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth is going to speak and pretty soon that stuff's going to be all over everyone around you and everybody's going to be impacted by the Jesus Christ that is in you somebody ought to give him praise up in this place Lord have mercy my Bible's all wet good Lord shoo somebody say shoo sorry whoever's got to clean that up But hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on. Put the rest of of Acts chapter 4 up for me. 21, 22, 23, 24. Just put it up for me really quick, really quick. After further threats, they let them go. After they said, we can't stop. We can't help but talk about what we've seen and heard. They could not decide how to punish them because all of the people were praising God for what what they had heard. It's powerful. For the man who was miraculously healed was, was over 40 years old. And on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported that the chief priest and the elders had said to them, verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Hold on. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Put 25 up. I know I didn't tell you 25. I don't know if 25's got anything to do with it or if it changes after 25. I don't know. Just put 25. If, if there's not a 25, don't worry about it. Okay, don't worry about it. There's something. They can't get it, but grab this. When they heard this, they raised their voices. So you spoke by the Holy Spirit to the mouth of the servant, our father David. Hold on a second. So you spoke through the Holy Spirit, through the mouth, through the mouth. Somebody say, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. But did you notice something? They started, the story started out in Acts chapter 3 in prayer. They were on the way to the temple at the time of prayer. The story ends in prayer. It's book ended in prayer. Book ended in prayer. And I know I've had a lot of time today, but I've got to give you this. I've got to give you this. And it's going to be in a future podcast, and you can probably get more information out of this podcast. Four ways you can pray. You can pray, and, and, and it's simple to pray this, these four ways. And you got to write this down at home. You need to give God your waking thoughts. When you get up in the morning, Daniel, just say, God, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going to be glad in it. God, just line me up today 
with the people that I need to be lined up with. Open the right doors, close the wrong doors, God, and let me give you glory today. God, just be with me today because this day is about you. Give God your waking thoughts. Then give God your waiting thoughts. You know how you're waiting on God to do something? Just give God, God, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I want to give it to you. I don't want to continue to worry about it. God, I just want to cast my cares upon you so that I'm giving it to you, God. So give God your waiting thoughts. Give him your waking thoughts, your waiting thoughts, and then give God your whispering thoughts during the day. So you're giving him your waking thoughts while you're waiting you're giving him your waking thought waiting thoughts then you give him your whispering thoughts those are the thoughts that you can't pray out loud at that moment maybe you're at work maybe you're in the restaurant and right now you're overwhelmed by something you know you just you found a hair in your burrito you found a difficulty in life and you're just overwhelmed by it. you probably don't want to jump up in the restaurant and start screaming out jehovah you're so awesome because probably somebody's going to escort you out but you can't give him your whispering thoughts like, God, you know where I'm at. You know what my needs are. God, I whisper these thoughts to you. Lord, may you be an ever-present help. May you help me with this fear. May you help me with this difficulty. And then at the end of the day, give God your waning thoughts. You're waking, you're waiting, you're whispering, and you're waning thoughts. God, today I gave it all to you. Now, as I lay my head down, God, may you just bless me, strengthen me, God. I've given everything to you today. Now, I also give you this. And watch what God will do when you start talking, not just about what he's done, but you also start talking to him. He'll do some incredible things in your life.